I'm Brad King, and this is Stories in Steel. On this episode, we travel to Portland, Oregon, and sit down with car builder extraordinaire Steve Frisbee of Steve's Auto Restorations. Starting with his humble beginnings of working out of his garage while also acquiring an education working at Boeing, Steve learned the art of building cars. Whether they're brass era restorations or custom designed full blown show cars, Steve has proved time and time again he has what it takes to be a master of his craft. So, Steve, how long how long have you been? I mean, you've been you've had the shop for a while. How, how long have you been doing this? I've been doing this for 47 years. And uh, I started out in a double car garage like most of us car guys do and just went on from there and got into a rental building that had some square footage. And then I finally ended up buying this building here, which is, I thought I'd never outgrow, but it's easy to fill it up. Were you always, well, we were talking about gas being in, in our veins because that's just kind of the way it is. Either you love cars or you don't. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'm assuming that you grew up with, did you grow up around cars or were you like the oddball in the family? You no, know, my dad was was a limited hot rodder. He had a service station and he, of course he was the head mechanic. And, you know, I'd, I'd when I was young, I'd go down to the service station and grandpa would run me up and down on the hoist, you know, and, and that was the highlight of the day. But um, I was always around him. Uh, and then when I got into high school and I wanted a car, dad helped me pull a 58 Impala out of the wrecking yard. And, it was actually in, in the earthquake zone in Alaska and it got flooded and so it was off down to here and we ended up getting it and anyway he, he helped me go through it. Was it was it in pretty good shape from the flood deal or Yeah, well everything that could get ruined by yeah. water was ruined, but okay. you know, we had to rebuild the motor and so that's kinda kinda where I got started and then um, when I got married I was uh, working at Boeing Aircraft which was another company by a na- another name down on Sandy Boulevard. And I worked in um, their deburring department and their machinist department and their assembly department. And then I got into their paint department and that's where I kind of stuck. I worked in their plating department too. So um, I even ran their paint department on the graveyard for several years. Well, this is good. You get to learn all these things that are kind of important to what you're doing now. You know what I say? Boeing taught me enough to go on my own and put it all onto cars. Absolutely. Yeah. So I was lucky that way because I didn't have a dad that really, you know, like some of the younger car builders today, younger than I am, car builders today, they came from dad who was a hot rodder and taught him how to do all this stuff. So basically, I kind of learned it on my own. So how long were you at Boeing? About 10 years. Oh. So long enough to yeah. learn a whole yeah. lot of things. I think uh, I started working at 12 years. I started working when I was 18 at Boeing, and I quit when I was 30. Okay. And went on my own. Well, that was, so you just went from a, a good, solid, steady job to hope this works. Is that yeah. kind of, that kind of <laughs> Hope this works. <laughs> and so, l- luckily, I had a home builder that had a couple cars, and he set me up with one right after another. So then I started restoring cars from ground up, and that's that's more complicated than just tearing a car apart and painting it. Right. But that's what I really liked. I liked everything from this bolt to this bolt, and in between, just doing it all. And you did the two car garage thing, and yeah, it was just that was your shop and everything. Everything in yours sat outside, and yeah. So how long did you do the garage thing? Um, probably four years. So you were at home for a while. And then we bought another house, and then it had an unfinished outbuilding out back that I could get five cars into. And so then I set up there, and I worked there for a lot of years. I had a paint booth there, and it was in a neighborhood too, but you can't get away with that kind of stuff nowadays, you know? All right. So I'm lucky that I cut my teeth well, when the neighbor, I could. The neighbors liked you well enough where <laughs> yeah. nobody bothered you. So yeah, yeah, you try to make sure you're friends with everybody. That's right. <laughs> Any paint stuff? No problem. I don't yeah. <laughs> So, so, so what was, I mean, now I see you, I mean, I see pictures of restored cars like, you know, Concours stuff and Pebble Beach and that kind of, 
that kind of group. And then there's a lot of hot rod stuff. You're playing with Riddler cars and roadsters and, and high-end hot rods. So but did you start with, with just the restorations? Is that what you started with? Yeah, when in the double car garage when I quit Boeing, um, there was a couple guys about a mile away, a couple of retired gentlemen that they restored Model A Fords for people. And so I hooked up with them and I did all their body work and paint for them. And so they were just doing tear down assembly and reassembly and stuff so they could put cars together faster. And um, boy, I tell you, I did so many Model A's that I can hardly stand to look at one anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I got my <laughs> reputation for painting off of doing painting wire wheels. And if you can imagine, I had three sets of wire wheels to paint, prime paint, fill the rust pits, sandblast fill the rust pits, prime and paint and sand. And you got to get in behind all those spokes when you're painting. I made a little fixture to set them on down. Oh, wow. And I had people bringing me wire wheels. Oh, I was so sick of wire wheels. I finally just had to say, I don't want to no do more. wire wheels anymore. Now, bingo, powder coat, sandblast and powder coat. Fills all the, all the really bad spots up and yeah. yeah. So, so, but it was restoration stuff. So when did it start yeah. going to the hot rod route? Um, well, then I got into the classics. Um, I've done uh, 1930 um, Packard, um, a supercharged Cord, a Sportsman, um, 540K, 33 Mercedes, one only Delahaye, uh, Daimler Green Goddess. Um, I started doing a lot of concourse cars, and then I started competing at uh, the concourse is like um, Forest Grove's a big one around here, and um, I've won best to show at Forest Grove five times, and then I was head judge out there one year, so I judge for them every year. So I've I've got that love, and and then probably 25 years ago we started leaning into the hot rods when they really started coming on strong, and uh, what I enjoyed with that is there's an element of creation and creating and in the classics well let me see they painted them red and blue and white and and you could get black leather or tan leather you know right. you could get white walls or black walls but in the hot rod world there's all there's just all that room for creating you went that direction is that kind of what you wanted to go with and get away from the restorations you had enough of the model a's obviously no more spoke wheels yeah well you know I'd really take a, another nice classic on, but I'm I'm out of that uh, classic element. I'm kind of out of the Pebble Beach element, even though I like to go there and see. I mean, some of the, they made cars in the 30s that pff, are just unbelievable to look at. They're just eye candy. All right. And so my dream was really to do more of that, but I got into the hot rods and, and the creation in the hot rods. Uh, was sufficient enough for me to really want to dig deep into this. We'll talk about we'll talk about the Riddler thing. That's kind of a big deal. You got you got the Sloniker Award, you know, in Southern California. You got the Riddler and, and the Detroit Auto Rama. Mm -hmm. And uh, was that something you had gunned for before, or was that just your first time at that? How did mm -hmm. that work? I had taken cars back to Detroit uh, three different years, and never tried to get into the Grade Eight. Um, but the pickup that we took back, the 33 Dodge pickup, made grade eight one year. And so, you know, it, it kind of puts a fever in you. So when I had, when we were designing the, the double dozen Roadster, the hand-built Roadster, um, I had that one steel or aluminum body. And um, I, I, had, I had a contract for um, uh, 24 of these bodies and chassis. We called the project the Double Dozen. So 12 were gonna be uh, aluminum bodies without fenders and 12 were gonna be aluminum with fenders. Okay. Well, long story short, it turned into an international breach of contract lawsuit on their side and I ended up suing the company. But I got one aluminum body back and I got my steel body back. And so the aluminum body, I had, um, I had people wanting to give me uh, deposits on 10 of them before I even had one. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't take a deposit, I just took a name. 
because I knew what I'd do. I'd go out and buy a hot rod or a car or right. something. <laughs> so anyway, um, so I had to break the news to everybody. Hey, this this deal's melting down. I, I can't I can't get these out of these people. And uh, one guy and I got one body. I got the aluminum body back. And so one guy in California, he called me and he says, "I got to have that body." I said, "Look, Jimmy," I said. I got to redo some of these panels. They just threw it together in the final end run. I mean, basically it was a good solid, you know, body, but some of this sheet metal needed to be massaged and everything. And he said, I got to have it. I want to go to Detroit. I want to compete for the Riddler. I said, well, okay, but we're going to have to remake some of this sheet metal. I can do the sheet metal here, but compared to the Polish labor rate to do these 24 is just, phenomenal difference you know sure so um we repaired he re, he paid to repair those panels and then um we started in on the project and i kept getting paid in different ways uh, a buddy's credit card one month and a check from somebody else the next month and a check from him and and it, it was all good money, so I just kept going. And all spins the same. All of a sudden, one day he calls me, and he says, "Steve, I can't explain it. The car's yours." And and he was into it pretty deep. And I said, "Really? Why not?" He says, "I can't explain it. I can't explain it." Well, I figured it out over the years. He was probably going through a divorce, and his wife didn't know about the car. So she half could not find out about the car. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I, I kept the I kept the car and for about a year, and then this other fellow out of um, Texas contacted me about it, and he said, "I've heard about this car that's not finished." And I said, "Yeah, I, I'll, somebody comes along, and picks it up, we'll run with it." And so he said, well, "Send me some pictures." So I sent him pictures and. He said, I'm going to fly over to, uh, let's see, where was it? I was in, in California, and we are doing a show. And he said, I'd like to see it. And I said, well, I'll drag it down there. It's just in bare metal. It's just a pusher, you know. So I, we took it down, and he sat in a chair like this, and he looked at that car for probably an hour while we talked. And, and he said, well, I'll have to think about it. So about six months went by, and finally he called, and he said, well, I want to go after the Riddler. And I said, why, why do you want to do that? He said, Steve, I've had a hot rod since I'm 19 years old. And he says, I just, I've always wanted, I've ha I have cars and I've competed in the, you know, the Friday night at Dairy Queen and so on and so forth. And he says, I really want to go for the Riddler. And I said, well, you know, that's hard to get. I've never been that close. And so he says, well, I can do it. He said, don't worry about it, I can do it. I said, okay. So he bought the project and away we went. And it was, um, he agreed with our creation. And of course, there was the whole car was never a car. So everything was fabricated. And he financially backed us to, to get there. So many years were in this car. I mean, not, not sitting dormant, but just working into this car. Right? Three years of work, okay. one, one year of dormant. Okay. And uh, so he, he had never seen the car after he saw that bare metal in peace in uh, California. Wow. Just, it's just the internet, back and forth, back okay. and forth, pictures, back and forth. And so uh, we took it to Detroit. I, we made a display for it, and I had lights rented from the ceiling down on it, and we just, it was just balls out, you know. He walked in, he flew in, he walked in, he walked up to the car, and at that time, he was 85 years old. Really? Yeah, first time he'd seen it. And then, you know, to actually win it, it's just, it's just a fog. You know, when something like that happens, right. it's just a fog. And he walked up on the stage, and it was, it was just like, like a, a pantomime, or like, like a statue <laughs> walking, you know. He was just in shock. So it was really... Um, Probably the most special time in my whole car life. Wow. That's so. Well, you go after it and then actually pull it off. That's a big one because there's some heavy hitters. There's yeah, some. You know, you're subject to whatever shows up that year. 
whatever yeah. doesn't show and whatever does. And and um, Detroit's got a different way of judging and different criteria. You know, every show kind of does. You just you have to do them each show a couple of times to kind of get the vibe for what they're that uh, promoter wants. What they're looking for. Yeah, yeah. That was that was a pretty lofty goal, and you went after it. So, yeah. right, no <laughs> doubt. Check that one off. What did you do after that? Did you go after any other any other high end stuff like that, or was it just we're just going to build regular hot rods, regular street cars, or what? Well, what do you do after that? Well, you hope another guy comes along that wants to wants to do that. Some builders don't want to go through that much trouble again, um, and and it's it is a lot of trouble. It's just. And there's always the money issue that you got to deal with. I would not tell anybody we're going to win Riddler. If you get into the grade eight, then you've pretty much made well, the grade eight. a good weekend, sure. Then you're just down to what's there that catches the promoter's eyes. Yeah, they're all judged, but it really falls down to the, the decision of the promoter, what he wants to see on his banner next year. You know, I know the car behind us is kind of kind of a special. Yeah, part of your history. So let's let's talk about that one a little bit. You, you know, you when we first we first started talking, you were showing me some pictures of it, and you go, well, "This is kind of my baby here." And so, so you ended up getting it back, kind of kind of do a redo on it. And yeah, the the first time I saw it was at at the Portland Swap Meet, and this was back when I was still in the restoration mode, okay. and it was just a tired old, um, elegant. German Dutch bodied Ford with a 37 Ford chassis, flathead motor. That's the way they built them. They sent the chassis over to Köln and there's a Dutch coach builder that would build a custom body for each chassis. And he had kind of a little assembly line. Every one was a little different. And the gauges were in German and you know it was just had that thick upholstery, German upholstery and a thick padded top because of the winters, you know, to, to get the, keep the occupants warm. But it was a tired old restoration car. And I'm really too busy to restore anything on my own. So I just had it around for quite a few years. And then there was a fellow that I eventually built 13 cars for him before he passed. But he saw the car and he says, well, if I buy that, would you make a hot rod out of it? I'm like, yeah, sure. So David did some renderings and uh, my designer did some renderings and we just kind of went from there. But this car has probably only got six or eight square feet of the original sheet metal on it. It's all just been restyled. Uh, just restored it, but tried to keep uh, the German flavor within the car. Um, the gauges originally were all done in German, all in the, the labels and everything was in German. So when we had classic make gauges to marry up to the Ford, we had all the gauges still put in German. And then the mid Mercedes used to have mother of pearl on the dash, that kind of mellow yellow mother of cream colored mother of pearl. So we put on the console, we did mother of pearl. So that brought a little more German flavor in. And then on the fenders, um, there's a chrome strip spear on the front and rear fenders. And a 29 um, Mercedes Cabriolet A had those on it, and that was just a little touch that I thought, well, we could get away with that, and it would add to the German atmosphere. And uh, all the guy, all the guys in the shop, they thought that was the dumbest idea they ever heard. So one night after they all went home, I, I took Ron over and I said, hey, Ron, let's make some cardboard spears and paint them silver and put them on the fenders. They came in the next day and they went, wow, that looks pretty good. <laughs> well, it's just, it just changed the look from typical, you know, stripped down hot rod to a very elegant look. It it put it into the elegant realm, yeah. It's like the trim around the top. I mean, it's a very unique look. Yeah. So, yeah, no, oh, it's great that you So that, that, on. that client passed and um, his wife donated it to the Peterson Museum for, they get a tax write-off if they donate it. And when I was in the Peterson one time, I saw it and I said, well, I'd like to buy that car when you go to sell it. I know they sell the cars after so many years. And the curator, it was a lady, and she said, well, we can't sell it to you. You're a private individual. It has to go through an auction. Well, I didn't know that. 
So well, I just, you know, put my name on the file then, would you? And then there was another car too that was there and I wanted to buy it. And so she put my name in that file. But anyway, it came up for auction. I didn't know anything about it. And it was uh, somebody bought it that just didn't know what they were getting. And they pretty much trashed it. I mean, it was, it was, that was one of David's first full blown designs. And it was really a, a favorite baby. You know, certain cars are special. Other cars are cars. So this one was special. Anyway, somebody bought it that pretty much trashed it. And then uh, he sold it at Barrett just this last year. And then the fellow who bought it called me. He says, I hear you built this car. And I said, oh, yeah. He said, well, this is wrong with it. This is wrong. This is worn out. This is bad. This is blah, 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 blah. And I said, you know, what you need to do is you just need to send the car back to me. And, and I'll do whatever it takes to make it all brand new again, except I'm not taking the body off the frame. I'm not going that far. Right. So we ended up pulling all the, the motor and all the suspension off. One of the front A-arms is bent and everything was scraped up underneath. Yeah, I beat it up. Yeah, yeah, yeah my baby. So it was, was a one only Dutch bodied Ford. That's crazy. And interesting enough, I got a letter from the European Preservation Society and they trashed me big time for what I was doing to this car. Really? They were really upset. Yeah. yeah but you preserve the car. They should be happy that you well, preserve it. It may not be original, uh, but it's still on, it's not uh, in the crusher. Hot rod somehow is a four letter oh, word to them. Come on, man, you know. It didn't get crushed. The thing's gorgeous. Just, it was just a Ford. It was just a funny looking Ford. Right. So now it's a, on its second rebirth. <laughs> so what uh, what are you what are you looking for in the future then? You got that you got the potential Riddler car out here that that project. What potential else? grade eight car. A potential grade eight car. Yeah. Let me yeah. rephrase. That. We don't want to get the right. Yeah. Sure. Gotcha. Well, I don't know. The, uh, the more creativity that we can do, the more I'm interested in it. You know, but it's also nice to pull in a 34 Ford and build it for a guy too. So I'm, I'm still, I'm not zeroed in on one goal necessarily. I just, I want to make a car perfect as I can. That's, that's my one goal. But as far as, you know, what we're working on or Corvettes, look at Corvettes. I got what, three or four of them in here now. Just finished two and, um, then one, that split window, we're just really cutting the bejesus out of it, you know. So you're back into the creativity mode. Now, being that you're not you're not the kid anymore, you're not out beating yourself up. You got you got employees helping you do the rough yeah. stuff, so you're not having to kill yourself. Yeah. Is it is it a good thing with the younger guys? I mean, are they are they grasping the hot rod world, or are they still takes the right kid? I mean, you gotta be you gotta be a hot rod guy, or you're not. I mean, a lot of the, there's a lot of kids that like cars, but not the stuff that you and I like. So we, I want a kid that's worked in the garage with his old man when he was young. And if I'm interviewing a guy and I, I hear that part of it in him, then I know he's a potential to spend more time talking to. But if they don't have a little blood or a little uh, gas run through their veins, right. you're not gonna ignite them, you know. But so I've just picked up a couple right now that just they're they're both good potentials. Um, I've had a lot of employees. I've trained a lot of employees. Um, they turn out to be your competition to a right. degree, you know. But there's if they were good employees, there's always that respect that I have for them and they have for me. And so it wasn't a fist fight when we parted, you know. I mean, I went on my own. You right. know, they have the right to go on their own can't keep them forever. You just don't want to have to compete. It's like, I don't want to compete because now they know all your secrets. They know. Well, yeah. They know a lot of what you do because they were here. Yeah. Well, so, that's true. But can they execute them? Right. You know? So. So any any big goals that you that you have left before you, before you write it off and call it quits? Well, I'll call it quits when they come in Monday morning and find me laying over a fender, I think. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I'd like to uh, I'd like to play deep into the field down at Grand National. 
um, and I'd like to play again at uh, Detroit. So, like Sloniker cars or AMBR Roadster stuff. What do you What do you want to play with down in down in Pomona? I haven't had good luck with the AMBR Roadsters. I mean, uh, <clears throat> I haven't had good luck coming away on the right end of the stick on that. Um, probably Sloniker. We've hit, we won the Sloniker when it was a gazillion years ago. You know, we had a thirty-two Ford that won it, but it's it's at a different level now than it was right. then. You know. Yeah, the game has been stepped up. Yeah, well, they're they're trying to compete with Detroit, and and uh, I'm pretty impressed with what, what they did this year. All right. So, they're good people. So you're 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 just you're not stopping, man. It's not. No, no, it's my life. You know, I I I can't stop. I don't want to stop. I just I'm here, eight nine hours a day. Phone's still ringing. Customers still going, hey, and you're going, hey, let's let's put this down on paper. Let's get a game plan here. And you know what? The bad part is, I was just talking to one of my guys the other day, and I said, you know, we're in. We couldn't be in a worse part of the country for the type of clientele that'll spend the money and the effort to go that route. I mean, you go east of the Mississippi, and there's so many people with our age. That are a lot more successful than I am with a lot of money and they want something and they'll pay to have it done. Southern Cal is the same way, kind of that way in Seattle. We, we get but some good jobs. You're not that far off the beaten path though. Yeah, but you don't rub elbows with those people every day, like going to the shows, like Troy goes to all those shows and Alloway and, you know, right. they're right in the middle of that population base. We're not. And then, Another thing about Southern Cal, it's tough to pull guys out of Southern, or customers out of Southern Cal because they can drive for a couple hours on Friday afternoon and see what's going Take on in their see car. See what's going on with their car, yes. Yeah. So I don't think that I would have gotten as far as we've come without the internet. Okay. That Riddler car was built the whole three years with him. Never saw the car, it was all on the internet. Pictures back and forth, back and forth. So we were one of the first uh, builders to put up a website. Really? Yep. Well, this is this is good. This is this is good. You've had a you've had a pretty good career with this. Yeah, I've had a good run. Yeah, I'm and yeah, I'm not done. No way. I'm not done. And I also have two guys that if something should happen to me, they can pick up the ball and run. They know every aspect of the business from the front office all the way out to the back. So I thought that, well, that'll be great. Then I can take two weeks off and go down, diving down in the Caymans or something. And, right. But I never take any time off. I take some time <laughs> off. I don't want to. <laughs> <laughs> so we're talking about, we're talking about the, early, the early classics. Of the brass era, the early 1900s into the 20s, and and uh, into that. So, have you have you played with a lot of those those type of cars? Not a lot of them. Um, I did uh, when I quit Boeing Aircraft. I did uh, body and paint work on a 1906 Cadillac, and I really like those types of cars. Um, but they're I'm going to say I'm too young to really have grown up with them, which is true but uh, and then I did a 1912 um, Ford for a client and then I've had a 1910 uh, Chalmers Detroit I didn't restore that I just had it and they're really fun to drive I mean they're scary to drive you don't know if you're gonna get from point A to point B but um, and then when I was into the hot rods started into the hot rods and classics my mother uh, belonged to the Frisbee Genealogy Society, and she sent me an article on a 1901 Frisbee. And I thought, oh, well, this is interesting. And so she did a genealogy search, and it turns out that um, I'm on the same Frisbee family tree, just on a lower branch. Right. You know? So he was a direct descendant, but... Um, he had a bicycle shop in Cromwell, Connecticut, in his garage behind his house. Yeah, Russell Abner Frisbee. And um, he built, back then the bicycle shops were, they'd buy a motor and 
then they'd get somebody to make fenders and they'd make a car. That's how cars started out, from right. the carriage and the bicycles. And so he decided he'd build this car. So he built this 1901 Frisbee and he called it the Red Devil. <laughs> the Red Devil. <laughs> Two-cylinder Red Devil. Uh -huh. So anyway, uh, it was a little roadster and it had an umbrella for a top and uh, it did have a steering wheel. It was one of the first cars to have a steering wheel. Um, Two-cylinder motor. He made his own casting, so his name is in the casting on the motor. And anyway, I, I started tracking this down and trying to find out where this car was. Russell Abner just kept it for multitude of years and never really drove it. He'd drive it in a parade or something. And the singer, James Melton, ended up buying it from him and put it in his collection. And so I heard about that and then I tracked it a little further and it ended up in, I found it in a small museum in, behind a uh, funeral home in Frankfort, Indiana. And I called him and I asked him if he'd sell me the car. And he said, well, I'm not interested in selling it, but I'll, I'll keep your name if you're interested. And I, I told him what my name was and so on and so forth. And uh, so he called me one day and he says, well, I think I'm going to sell the car. And I said, well, what do you want for it? Well, being a car guy, I decided to dicker with him. And he ended up saying, buzz off, and he sold it to somebody else. So several years later, another guy calls me and he says, I've got the Frisbee car. Would you be interested in buying it? So we went through this all over again. And he told me a price, and then I started dickering with him again. <laughs> so you know what happened. Buzz off. I sold it. So I thought, well, <clears throat> I've blown it two times. Twice. That's probably the last time. Then I get a call from a guy out of Colorado, and he says, my father on the East Coast passed away, and my brother and I split his collection. And I got this 1901 Frisbee, and I don't know what to do with this thing. He says, and I saw your name in the paperwork. I said, yeah. I said, well, you're going to sell it? He says, yeah, I'm going to sell it. And I said, well, how much do you want for it? And he says, well, it's got to go through probate. It's probably going to take a year. And I said, okay, I'm not even going to ask you how much you want for it. Just promise me that I'll be the first call you make. And he did yeah, after that year. And he called It was me. a year? It took a year? Oh, Another year. Wow. I got 35 years in this journey. No doubt. Yeah. So he called me and he named a price and I thought, this time, I don't dicker with him. <laughs> Just say, okay. So where was it over the over the years? Was it was it pretty close or was it? Way no, up I was in well, Cromwell, Connecticut, Frankfort, Indiana. No, but I mean, I mean, I mean the price. You know, you turned out you were you were dickering with this one that you're doing. Oh yeah, it, it goes it? up. You know. It okay, so it just up. kept going up. Yeah, but it was still reasonable. Okay. You know, I knew enough about brass cars to realize it was reasonable. And being a one only, I mean, how do you know? If you wanted to sell it someday, sometime you can find that guy that has to have it, you know, for his collection. But it's home in my building now, and it's in so my... you still have it. Oh yeah, I have, yeah, I'll I'll keep it. Yeah. Okay, it's just yeah, the frisbee. That's kind of cool. Yeah, the fris frisbee red devil. So how how well? I guess I need to ask you about your name. How common is your name? I you're the only one I've ever heard with the last name. Yeah, it's fairly common. It's fairly common. Uh, it's spelled three different ways. Uh, back on the, there's B E E and B I E and B Y, on the end of frisbee. But um, yeah, they got genealogy society and a little pamphlet. They were stoked when I got that car. They wrote a whole article for their oh, newsletter. Oh, that's great! It. Well, yeah. you're part of the lineage, and you ended up with that. That is yeah, kind of yeah, cool. Yeah. So and had the ability to restore it. So didn't yeah. have to. So it's all it's all like it was then. Yeah, you know? it's all like it was. It has one one headlight. Two parking lights, one tail light, all brass, and it's got tubes across the front, and that's the radiator. The tubes are probably two inches in diameter. That's the radiator. Well, how long did it get restored? It never was. It's a real. This is everything is just like it was then. It's never yeah, been even the upholstery, even the up. the Surrey top. That's amazing. It's crazy. Yeah. So you get the brass car. You uh, 
Are, do you have much of a collection? Are you a collector? I mean, are you are you one of those guys that can't that can't leave it alone, or what's your deal as far as that? No, goes? I've I've got I don't know twenty three, twenty four cars. Okay, you got some cars. Um, I like to um, buy original car if it's a thirties car and older. I like to buy an original one if it's got thirty thousand miles or forty thousand in original interior and stuff. And I, I I kind of feel it's a sacred piece, so you just don't mess with it. You know, and in other cars, I bought some customers' cars back when they're ready to sell. Ones that I particularly liked when we built them, and I, I know how much money's in them. Right. I know how much money he wants, and it's all working. You know. Sure. So I bought some like that back, and then I've I've got several Corvettes, but I've had them in containers and rental places and storage units, and I've never seen all my cars together at one time so i just we bought a place um we lived in downtown portland for 15 years in uh the it's called the paulson house it's a three-story queen anne victorian we just we just had a ball in that house wow we yeah we did all antique period furniture and lighting and ceiling medallions and it's it's on the historical registry it's just it was incredible we were just my my wife and I were just in our element, you know. Right. So anyway, downtown Portland got so bad, so bad. Graffiti and um, all the negative stuff going on and confronting people, defecating on your sidewalk. And I, just, I told my wife, I said, we got to get out of here. I'm going to be in jail for doing something. Right. And so we bought five acres out in Estacada, and it's got... Um, to overlook Mount Hood and the uh, um, Clackamas River, really nice and quiet. And now I've got deer and coyotes pooping on my yard, <laughs> but I can handle it. <laughs> so did you build up? Did you? Do you have a shop where you can put all your cars in? Yeah, I build a building. Okay, um, so you don't have them all in containers and renting and all. You're you're in one spot. And my my Steve Mahal, the Steve Mahal is twice the square footage of my house, so I've got my priorities. Oh, you're the hot rod hero, man! Absolutely. um, And so we just I just finished it. I was working on it for about four years, and um, did all pressed cobblestone floor, and I've got an 18 foot cobblestone uh, uh, cement uh, turntable underneath the office and. Big backlit murals on the walls and the backlit onyx staircase going up to the second level and lots of restored gas pumps and so it's just I kinda I lost it, you know. Well you get to do what you did in Portland. You just get to do it more from the hot rod car guy angle instead of restoring the building. So the house we got had tall ceilings, so I could take all that antique furniture with us and not have to get rid of any of it. It's just like anything else, you know, when you start collecting something, okay, you collect this and this is cool, and then you collect this, and then you start getting refined, and you go, well, that's really not that cool. This is really cool over here. Of course, it's more expensive, too. Of course. That's so. amazing. So you kept all that stuff, sold the house in Portland, and you moved out to the boonies. Now it's quiet, and nobody yeah. bothers you. And I've got a... On the turntable, we we think we can like debut a customer's car out there, and I've got a upstairs bedroom, either an office and upstairs bedroom. They just sleep with their car if they want to stay with the <laughs> So it's uh, it was kind of it was fun. It was fun, but it, it uh, the building project really wore me out. It's not like a car, you know. I mean, I got these guys to help me. I mean, I didn't physically saw the wood or anything. I just made the money to make it right. go and making all the decisions and it's just like anything else I get involved with, I gotta complicate it, you know. Gotta make something simple really difficult. Yeah, well, yeah, why not? <laughs> so. so are you done with the shop? I mean, is it is it as done as it's gonna get or do you, do you have more stuff to do? Um, I've just got um, an RV bay, which I'll, I'll never have an RV. And now I got, I got off on a really weird kick that I've got. I'm restoring a 1935 Bolus aluminum camp trailer. Okay. And the Bolus is in the camp 
trailer world is kind of like the guru that the Roman column pump is in the gas pump world. And so uh, I bought this trailer from a guy down in California, and all original. Still had the original cushions in it, and so it had the original curtains, so we're duplicating all that. And it's the craze now is to buy an old camp trailer and make it modern, but my, re my restoration background, I think it would be sacrilegious to take something that was that original and put an electric stove in it and an electric refrigerator. And, you know. So I'm, I'm just restoring it all back to, back to original. And I, and I think that, and they, they get good money for the ones that they restore, you know, back to usable, modern, but I think the museum is going to want that someday. That's kind of how you're looking at it, looking at it from a museum yeah. standpoint. But I, I like, you know, I like to save the soul of stuff that's got enough soul to save. I like that. Steve, thank you very much for You're welcome. sitting down with me. I appreciate that. I, it was great. Glad to meet you. Good I love talking with you. you. And yes, thank you very much, sir. Swap some lies and Absolutely. go from there.